Welcome, welcome. Thanks for joining everyone on our Thursday night. My name's Clarissa. I'm the program and volunteer coordinator for the Puget Sound Estuarium. And we run this program called Discovery Speaker Series, where we host artists, educators, scientists, and community partners um, to share about their current work or organization to help spark conversations in our community. We host these in the fall and winter from October to March, every first Thursday of the month from 6.30 to 7.30. So make sure to tune in for the next couple as well. Um, if you have any questions for our speaker today, you're more than welcome on Zoom to go into the Q&A session and you can type in your questions there. Or if you are on Facebook Live, feel free to type in the comments below this video and we'll get to your questions at the end of our presentation. We'll have about 15 minutes towards the end to answer all of your questions that you may have. Um, if at some point you need to leave or you think that this talk would be really interesting to someone, uh, we will have it up on Facebook, and then we will also have it posted on YouTube so that you can feel free to watch it uh, at a later time if you have to leave, or feel free to share that link with your friends and family. So today, I am very excited to welcome Bill Dewey, and he can take it away. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Sorry for the delay there. Been good to go here. Thanks, Clarissa. Appreciate the opportunity to be part of your discovery series here. I think I'm your first speaker for the fall here. So again, I'm Bill Dewey. I'm Director of Public Affairs for Taylor Shellfish Farms. And I've been doing that for Taylor's for a little over 30 years. I also have a shellfish farm of my own up in Skagit County in Northern Puget Sound. So I'll talk a bit about, uh, you know, what we do for shellfish farming here in Puget Sound and some of the challenges we face and some of the get into some of the ecosystem services provided by shellfish crops as well. So just a quick overview of uh, farm shellfish in Washington State. This isn't uh, Puget Sound specific, but just a broad overview of the state of Washington to show you the economic contribution and the jobs that are provided by the industry and these numbers you know may not seem all that large in the grander scheme of Washington state's economy when you think of some of the bigger businesses in the state but it, what is significant is that uh, these jobs are in the rural counties so for example in Mason County where tailors are based Collectively, not just tailors, but all of the shellfish growers there uh, are the second largest employ private employers in the county. And then out in Pacific County, out on the coast, the shellfish industry is the largest private employer. So in these in the rural areas, the jobs that are created by the industry are important ones. Washington leads the country in farm shellfish production. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is. So in Washington state, um, we're actually able to own our tidelands, and that's unique. If you're going to have a shellfish farm in, in other states in the country, you have to lease those tidelands from the state. But Washington, shortly after we became a state, uh, passed some laws that sold tidelands into private ownership specifically for the purpose of growing, at that time, the native oyster, the Olympia oyster. There was a wild fishery for that native oyster in the 1800s. And as that resource got depleted, once we became a state, uh, some of the very first laws the legislature passed were oyster laws. So they, um, the first thing they did was 
create oyster reserves. They took all of the productive native oyster beds left in the state and made them oyster reserves not for sale. And then they passed two laws, the Bush Act and the Callow Act in 1895 to allow for barren tide lands to be sold into private ownership to grow that native oyster to try to encourage an industry to, to restore that resource, uh, recover that resource. So it worked well. There was about 47,000 acres of Tidelands sold under those two laws. Uh, the states stopped selling Tidelands back in the 19, early 1970s. Also in Washington state, if you own waterfront property, you own the Tidelands out in front of your house. And those are referred to as second class Tidelands. And there's a lot of shellfish farmed on those second class Tidelands as well as the Bush and Calamac Tidelands. But that, that was a driver behind the success of the industry because once you could own those Tidelands, you had an asset that you could take to the bank and borrow money against to start to build your business, make improvements to your Tidelands or purchase seed. The industry would purchase their oyster seed from those state oyster reserves to plant out on their um, oyster farms. And then the laws later changed. Uh, in the early 1900s, I think it was 1919 or thereabouts, that uh, the laws were changed to allow us to grow other species of shellfish besides just the native oyster. And that's just an example of this slide just shows some of those Bush and Calawack tidelands in Samish Bay. But if you were to zoom in on a lot of the South Sound inlets uh, and look at the properties, you'd notice these same parcels out in the middle of the bay that aren't attached to the shoreline. And that's an indication that they're a Bush Act or Callow Act parcel and that they have their own meets and bounds descriptions uh, disconnected from the shoreline. These are the different species of shellfish uh, that are grown in Puget Sound. You have across the top pictures of what they might look like coming off the farm and then below what they you might see in a restaurant. But you got the, the mussels, a couple different species of mussels are farmed in Puget Sound the manila clam, a variety of different species of oysters. Those are Pacific oysters pictured there. And then of course the gooey duck. This is a, a breakdown from 1986 to 2013. So a bit dated for statistics, but I suspect the ratios are probably similar as far as the species produced there. This is for Southern Puget Sound, which I'm guessing most of the audience maybe that's on here is participating from. The orange on the bottom is oysters, and then the green are manila clams, the red are gooey duck, and the blue are mussels. So you know, between 800,000 and, and a million uh, pounds of, sorry, 10 million pounds of shellfish, 8 million and 10 million pounds of shellfish produced in South Sound from the farms. Also, uh, the shellfish resources here in Puget Sound are really uh, important to Native American tribes. Obviously, they've been harvesting for thousands of years before we arrived, and, and it's an important resource for them. They've been good partners. We like to work. They're our neighbors, and we partner with them on a variety of issues, particularly as it relates to the health of Puget Sound and restoring water quality. They're, they're great partners in that regard. And, also as far as producing the resources. So they have hatcheries and farms as do we. And, and so there's a great collaboration between us and our tribal neighbors. Shellfish farming is culturally and historically important to the region. It's gone on here for a lot of years. Taylor, the Taylor family started back in 1890 in Totten Inlet. And, and today they have grown to farm in all of the different inlets in Puget Sound. We have farms throughout South Sound other than Bud Inlet and, and Bud Canal, Northern Puget Sound, up in Samish Bay, out on the coast in Willapa Bay. We've got a hatchery on the Hood Canal to produce seed. We have another hatchery nursery operation in Kona, Hawaii, a big nursery operation in Humboldt Bay in Northern California. And then we have our own oyster bars. We have a few oyster bars in Seattle, another one up at our Samish Bay operation. And we've expanded also to have farms up in British Columbia and another oyster bar up in Vancouver, BC as well. So 
here in the United States, I think between our different operations, we've got about 600 employees now. So still very much a family business. The Taylor family is all actively involved in all the day-to-day -day operations. So this is the oyster that we started with. This is the native Olympia oyster, you know, full grown. They're about the size of a 50 cent piece. Um, that industry, they were farmed for all, you know, since the late 1800s into the early 1900s. And then the industry struggled uh, with impacts from um, siltation from logging practices and effluent from the pulp and paper industry. And that is when we shifted over and started farming the Pacific oyster that was introduced here from Japan in the early 1920s. The native oyster is really vulnerable to temperature extremes when it's exposed. So if you have a cold winter night, they would freeze or a hot summer uh, daylight tide, they would cook. So where you'd find them in the in the wild was in typically in tide pools where they stayed wet. So once the shellfish industry was able to buy tide lands, they terraced the beaches and built dike walls on the beaches to where if there was gonna be a, a weather extreme, a heat, heat or cold extreme tide, they could put boards and gaps in those dike, dike walls and keep a half a foot of water or so over the oysters to buffer them from those temperature extremes. So this is just a picture of some of those Olympia oyster dikes here in South Sound uh, back in 1910. Those, a lot of those dike structures, if you go around Southern Puget Sound, you'll see those dike structures today. Most of them are growing manila clams or Pacific oysters. We continue to farm the Olympia oysters as well. And we work with the Puget Sound Restoration Fund, a nonprofit group that's uh, actively working to restore that native oyster as well. So, this is some of the uh, pitch, historic pictures from downtown Olympia to show uh, some of the historic presence down there of the oyster processing plants. This was the Olympia Oyster Company's first plant on 4th Avenue uh, from 1893. The Brenner's plant on 4th Avenue uh, in 1898. Another Brenner plant, their second plant on 4th Avenue in the early 1900s there. The Olympia Oyster Company second plant on 4th Avenue. That's the, the Oyster House restaurant today. So I mentioned the industry transition to the Pacific Oyster from Japan. It was introduced around 1920, 1921. It grows well in the Puget Sound. It's used to a little bit warmer waters where it's na native in Japan. And so it doesn't reproduce all that successfully in many areas in Puget Sound. So the industry relied on getting seed from Japan for about a 50 year period. Uh, they would send a representative over for the Growers Association who would purchase seed for the entire industry. They'd get loaded onto ships in these wooden, uh, they're actually old sake crates. Uh, the seed would get loaded into those and get shipped over. And the growers would meet the ships when they arrived and offload the seed onto their boats and take it out to plant on their farms. That seed supply diminished for various reasons in the late 1960s and 70s. And that's when the industry transitioned to producing seed in hatcheries. So this is our hatchery up on the Hood Canal. So all of these animals that we farm have a similar life cycle. We all have males and females and they typically spawn once a year. Uh, they'll condition to do that spawning over a course of a few months and then release gametes, their sperm and eggs into the water. And fertilization happens externally in the water. The sperm penetrates the egg and generally within about 24 hours, they've got a recognizable shell. And they're microscopic at this point. They have a, a swimming and feeding organ that's called a vellum that they, they motate with and feed on microscopic algae. And then after two or three weeks, they built up enough shell, they're no longer buoyant. They settle out of the water column and begin their life on the bottom. In the case of oysters, they secrete a cement and glue themselves onto old oyster shells or other substrates, but they prefer old oyster shell. Clams will just burrow into the substrate and begin their life in, this, in the sediment and 
muscles will secrete that bissel thread and attach with that bissel thread to something. Ropes on our farms is what we secure them on. But so we do that in the hatchery. We can bring those animals in and by warming up the seawater and feeding them different diets of plankton, you can convince them to think it's summertime and time to spawn pretty much any month out of the year. So we're constantly conditioning brood stock so we've got animals ready to spawn throughout the year. Um, and there's no artificial food in the hatchery form, so a lot of the effort there is growing multiple species of plankton to feed them as they go through their larval stages. So, so this tank here, uh, this lady's introducing that oyster larvae into the tank there, that brown haze you see in the water is probably about 20 million baby oysters that she's putting into that tank. And then some of the algae culture that we grow there to feed feed all the larvae. Another this a new some new technology we've gotten out of San Diego for growing high density algae cultures in the hatchery. And this has been a nice new development for us. Allowed us to really efficiently produce a lot of food, which is always the limiting factor in the hatchery. I mentioned we have another hatchery over in Kona, Hawaii. So growing growing uh, the seed in our hatcheries in the wintertime here in Washington is challenging. The, the sun grows goes out and the waters get cold. So we spend a lot of energy in the greenhouses, uh, grow lights to grow the algae, and then energy to heat the seawater up to get the metabolism of the seed up so that it'll eat this algae that you're kind of fighting Mother Nature to grow as well. And, so we realized probably 25 years ago now that these things are tiny. You can actually put about 20 million of them in a little six pack beer cooler with a gel ice pack and fly them anywhere in the world. And there was an aquaculture park there in Kona. It has like 330 days of sunlight and hot and cold running seawater. So it's just a really efficient place to go grow algae and, and raise our juvenile shellfish. So we went over there and Eventually, it started out as a nursery and then eventually has grown into a hatchery, but a really important facility. And the animals are small when we're moving them back and forth from Washington and Hawaii to where the air freight is insignificant. It's, it's a really efficient way for us to, to produce seed. Other companies have followed us over there, uh, both for the advantages that we've recognized, but also when the ocean acidification issue hit and we were all having troubles producing oyster seed here in Washington and on the Oregon coast, they recognized that Kona was a, a safe haven that didn't experience the same upwelling and ocean acidification problems and they could produce, produce seed over there. So when it leaves the hatchery, it's only a millimeter or two in size. So it's still too small to go on a farm and survive. So there's another nursery step typically before it goes out to the farm. This is our, what we call our FLUPSI, which stands for floating upwell system in Oakland Bay near the town of Shelton. And there the seed are just put into these aluminum bins with screens on the bottom. And, and you're just creating a flow with these paddle wheels that brings the natural plankton that's in the bay to the shellfish that are in those nursery bins. The yacht club that you see in the background there, there's about 10 of those boat houses that's, that uh, shellfish companies have uh, flupsies in instead of boats have nurseries in. This is Chelsea Farms. Some of you know the Chelsea Oyster Bar downtown Olympia there. This is Chelsea's nursery in one of those boat houses there where they're growing their oyster seed. Some baby oysters there. This is our, our flupsy down in Humboldt Bay in Northern California, so another seed operation for us. This is what those bins look like. Those big aluminum bins have a screen on the bottom of them and just uh, plug into these channels where the paddle wheels create the flow that brings the water and food up through the oyster seed in the screens. And then this is a seed grader that uh, grades the seed for size. So those when we sell that seed or take it out to our farms, people are typically putting it into a cage or a bag to grow it in and the seed has to be a size so that it'll stay inside that mesh and not fall through. So 
you know, order a certain size seed, it needs to be uniform so they don't lose it through the mesh of their, their growing unit. It also helps us when we go to sell it so that we can do a count, take a liter and count a liter and then extrapolate that to the volume of seeds so we know the count. There's some of the oysters typically, that's the size that might typically go out of the nursery to a farm. So it's a different process for producing seed for shucked oyster meat, where we grow clusters versus the single oysters. So I mentioned that oyster larvae likes to attach to a piece of shell. When we're growing the single oyster, we'll take the old oyster shells, grind them up, sift them on a sieve. So every shell fragment's only like 300 microns in size and only room for one baby oyster larvae to attach to it. When we're growing oysters, for shucked oyster meat production, we'll take the whole oyster shells and wash them and bag them up in these plastic mesh bags. We'll put those pallets into tanks full of heated seawater and introduce the larvae from the hatchery that's a few weeks old and ready to go through that metamorphosis and glue onto that shell. They'll do that over the course of a few days. And then within a week or so, they're secure enough securely attached to the shell that we can take those pallets out and put them in the bay and just let them continue to grow in those bags. After a few months, they get up to roughly a quarter of an inch in size. As you can see all the brown freckles here on the shelves, it's referred to as spat. That's the industry term for the this oyster seed that's attached to the shell. And that shell is referred to as culch, C-U-L-T-C-H. And at that size, we can open that bag up, spread that shell, pile that shell on the deck of a boat and take it out to plant it. And we do that with a water cannon, just spray that seed off onto a bed. You can see the mark stakes on the bed there that the boat operator is driving between. And he's just spraying that seed off into a thin layer on the bottom. This is up in Samish Bay uh, in northern Puget Sound. And then a few years later, you come back and hopefully have a bed that looks something like this with big oysters on it. These are in this shot, they're just covered with olive with sea lettuce, but uh, nice healthy oysters with new growth on the shelves there. And those oysters would be harvested and brought in for processing for shucked oyster needs. If the ground's too soft and muddy to support the oysters, if the oyster sinks into the mud, it, it'll suffocate and die. It just it doesn't have a siphon like a clam does to stick up to the surface. It just gapes its two shells apart and pumps the water through. So if it goes sinks into the mud, it'll suffocate. So where we have muddy ground, we do what we call long lining, where we take that mother shell with the baby oysters attached to it, string it into a braided poly rope, and then string those up on these PVC pipe stakes and grow the whole crop up off the bottom. That generates this big flower, a big cluster of oysters that then get harvested and brought into the processing plant and the shuckers just work their way around those, those clusters to cut the meat out of the shell. Harvesting is done into these big steel crates. We take these out at high tide to the bed that we're gonna be harvesting and, and push the tubs overboard and then the crew comes back at low tide and, and picks the oysters off the beds and dumps them into the tubs. Those tubs have ropes and buoys on them so we can pick them up at high tide. This time of year, our low tides are in the middle of the night. We just transition here in September over from daylight tides to night tides. And so from now until April, all of our crews are out in the middle of the night doing their harvesting. This is the boat recovering those oyster tubs. And then we grow a lot of single oysters, uh, both on the bottom, uh, like you see in this picture, this is a bed in Totten Inlet, a bed of single oysters. This is another way we grow those single oysters. This is what we call a flip bag. Um, so the oyster seed goes in these mesh bags and the, you can see the buoys on those bags. So when the tide comes in, that bag flips up and when the tide goes out, it rotates back down. So it's going up and down, up and down constantly as the oysters grow. And as they tumble, it takes all the fluting off the shell that you see a, a beach grown oyster is all fluty like that. But when you tumble them, it changes the shell shape 
it takes all that flutiness out of it, gives the oyster a really nice deep cup and makes it a really premium oyster for eating raw in the half shell. So that's tailors have trademarked their, their flipped oyster, the Shigoku oyster. Different companies will have different names for them, like Chelsea's, they call theirs the Chelsea Gems. They flip oysters. It was actually their dad, John Lentz, uh, who developed that method for flipping oysters. So kind of a cool innovation that he came up with. There's an oyster growing up in Canada. It's called the Cushy, which are grown in trays underneath rafts. And that oyster farmer, when they grow underwater like that, 24 hours a day, they get really fluty and really brittle. And it's hard to market them because you chip the shells really easily and damage them and the liquor drains out of them. So he would take them every few months and run them to a tumbler and then put them back in the trays to take all that fluting off the shell. And it would create this cupped oyster, really nice cupped oyster with a hard bill on it. And John Lent saw that and thought, you know, it was a beautiful oyster and a char characteristics he wanted to achieve, but he didn't want to do all that work. So he came up with this idea of putting them in a bag with a buoy on it so they would the tide would tumble them instead. And it worked really well. So other companies have adopted John's method there. Hamahamas does it as well. They call theirs the blue pool. A number of companies do this now because it just really makes a nice oyster. That's the picture of the Shigoku there. And tailors here uh, uh, have started growing oysters in floating bags. We started doing this on our farms up in British Columbia. Um, a lot of those farms up there are in deep water. And we've had different systems over the years to grow oysters there. But the floating bag is one that we're pretty excited about for producing the single oysters on the half shell. It'll give us a, a premium oyster like the flip bags will. But it also will allow us to not have to work the night tides and get better work schedules for our crews. And so we actually have a, a permit pending uh, right now in Oakland Bay near Shelton for uh, a floating bag farm. So the Kumamoto is another species of Japanese oyster. It was introduced by the Department of Fisheries back in the 1950s. They thought it might be a replacement for the native Olympia oyster. But by then the industry had transitioned to the Pacific oyster, which is a faster growing, larger oyster, and they were all doing shucked oyster meats. So people weren't very excited about farming the Kumamoto because it was slow growing and small. For shucked oyster meats, it wasn't it wasn't popular. But as the industry over the last 30 years has transitioned to more of a half shell industry um, and the appeal of eating oysters raw in half shell, people like a variety, and this Kumamoto is a premium half shell oyster. It's like that Shigoku, it's small, deep cupped, really produces a premium little round ball of meat inside that shell. It's popular for eating raw. This is our Kumamoto farm in Oakland Bay, our main Kumamoto farm. This is a this is tide lands that were actually sold into private ownership by the territorial government before we became a state. So this is a long history of producing shellfish here in Chapman Cove in Oakland Bay. Very productive piece of ground. We actually grow manila clams in the gravel and then kumamotos on top. And we'll go through and harvest the kumamotos. A clam digging crew will come in and dig the clams and then we'll reseed the clams and reseed the kumamotos and start it again. And this is the manila clam. This is actually a non-native clam that came in as a coattail rider in those wooden crates of Japanese oyster seed and got established here and supports a, a pretty vibrant industry. It's the main steamer clam. If you were to order uh, clams in a restaurant, this is probably what you're getting. It's what you see in the retail markets. This is, uh, we grow the clam, most of our manila clam seeds uh, produced over in our Kona facility where we grow the seed in raceways. So that's just a handful of solid mass of baby clams there in the bottom of the raceway. Most of our clams are dug uh, by people on their hands and knees with rakes. Uh, a lot of them are grown in gravel beaches. So you have to have people that are digging them saying, this is a clam, this is a rock, clam rock, or this clam is big enough. This one's too small and we leave it to next year and so on. So lots of jobs, pop, it's a popular job 
uh, we, you know, between us and others in the industry, there's hundreds of people out there on the low tide digging clams. Some of the finished product that you might see in a restaurant. And then the gooey duck is our, our most recent product that we've uh, been farming. This started experimenting with these back in the 1990s, picking up on a method that was actually developed by the Department of Fisheries to do gooey duck enhancement in the state parks, where they would produce the seed in a hatchery up at Point Whitney and, and plant it out in these PVC tubes on the beach in the state parks. And we basically just took their technology and, and commercialized it. And it took a while for people to figure it out, but it, by the 2000s, uh, Taylor's and other companies were doing it on a commercial level successfully. So there's a wild harvest fishery, as people may be familiar with in, in Puget Sound that harvests about 4 million pounds of clams a year. And that's divided between the tribes and the uh, non-native harvesters managed by the Department of Natural Resources. The farmed industry now, I would guess, is getting close to 2 million pounds, almost half the wild harvest with the gooey duck production on the farms now. The industry started, again, using that method developed by Department of Fisheries, planting them in these PVC pipes. And a number of growers still use the PVC nursery tubes. They go in the tubes for the first year or two because the seed's really vulnerable to predation at that stage. Then the tubes come off and, and they go for another roughly four years without any protection on them uh, until they're harvested. So about a six year crop cycle with the gooey duck. Tailors have transitioned away from the PVC and are using these mesh tubes now. And, and they're they seem to be more effective for us. They're less apt to come out of the ground uh, with storms than the PVC pipe. And the water circulates better through them. So the gooey duck generally do, do a little bit better, we think, in the mesh tubes. Uh, so this is how we're planning them now. Again, the tubes are on for the first couple of years and then off for the next four. This is our gooey duck seed nursery in Totten Inlet. All those trays have a, are aligned with sand and, and have about 1,500 baby gooey ducks in each of those trays. And that whole unit lowers down on those hydraulic rams into the water. There you can see the, the siphon holes from the baby gooey ducks in the sand there. And the siphon sticking up out of the sand. That's about the size of the seed that we take out to the farms to plant typically. This is just showing how those tubes get used as a habitat. You take a barren sand flat and put a structure in it. It becomes appealing to a lot of critters to utilize that structured habitat. So this is a time-lapse video showing the variety of things that are racing around out there in the tubes. We haven't done this with our mesh tubes, but I suspect it's probably a similar level of activity with the, with the mesh tubes. And then we harvest the gooey duck uh, with a um, high volume, low pressure pump. It's the same method that the wild gooey duck harvest is done by divers. Uh, and so we've just adopted that same method where you pump water into the ground beside the gooey duck siphon, run your arm down the siphon as you're pumping the water in until the gooey duck becomes loose and then you can extract it out of the ground. They put rubber bands around them because they're when they live three feet down in the sand, they're, they've relied on the sand to hold their shells closed and they don't need to close up tight like say a manila clam that's going to go dry up at the surface and needs to stay wet by closing up tight and avoid predation. The gooey duck avoids predation by being three feet down and just retracting its siphon for predator comes and it never dries out down that deep either. So the muscles are not very strong. So if you if you don't put a rubber band around it within a couple of days, it'll be gaped open and dead. So. We also do dive harvesting on our inner tidal farms. Um, we're farming the lower, the gooey duck are farmed in the lower regions of our farms and not accessible on all that many tides. So in order to supply the market, we've adopted the diver harvesting as well as the intertidal harvesting. <clears throat> 
gooey duck are get big, you know, they get big and they get old. Uh, this is an eight pounder here. I think the record gooey duck is over 16 pounds. And I think the, the oldest one aged alive was over 160 years old. So interesting critter. They say there's more biomass of gooey duck in Puget Sound than any other animal, which I don't know if that's true or not, but I know there are huge beds of them subtitally. They go down hundreds of feet deep and the commercial harvesting is limited to between 18 and 80 feet. So there's beds that never get touched by any of the harvesting are really extensive. Recreationally harvesting gooey duck, you know, if you Google it or go on YouTube, you'll get lots of fun pictures of people hamming it up as they're doing it. But uh, a pretty common method is to take a metal garbage can and cut the bottom out of that garbage can. And, and then you start digging a big hole around your the siphon that you find on the beach. And as the hole starts to cave in, you stick that garbage can into your hole and then start digging inside the garbage can and pulling the sediment out, pushing the can down, working it down until you finally get to the clam. They can't dig away from you. They're just down there and they just retract their siphon. Uh, so you just have to get to them, but they're down typically about the length of your arm. So some of the finished product there. Mussels are grown uh, suspended from rafts. It's uh, the one crop that we do that's not intertidal. They, the seeds produced in the hatchery and attached to ropes that hang down from the raft. Again, pretty nice habitat on those mussel rafts, and all sorts of fish use that habitat. These are up in Penn Cove. This is some juvenile salmon that were captured by someone with their iPhone swimming and, and feeding in the rafts there. Some of the finished product processing. This is a, the shucked oyster meat. People just work their way around those clusters of oysters, cutting the meat out of the shell. That meat gets Washed and packed into various size containers, graded for size and packed into containers. This is some of the half shell, the processing equipment for grading the single oysters. We have a big live holding system there uh, at our facilities in Shelton uh, for holding the oysters in prior to sale. This is my personal farm up in Samish Bay where I grow manila clams and I've kind of pioneered mechanized clam farming there, growing the clams in rows, four foot wide rows in the sand. There's some of the clam seed and planting the seed in those nets. And then this is a tulip bulb harvester that I uh, spotted at the Washington Bulb Company about 20 years ago, realizing that the tulip bulbs were about the same size as my clams and convinced them to let me take it out and give it a try. It worked really well. I didn't want to have to pick the clams up. It used to just drop the tulip bulbs behind the machine and you had to pick them up off the ground and we put a potato conveyor on it. So it brings the clams up and puts them into baskets on the back of the machine. As you can see it's pretty efficient. We go out, we have about a two and a half to three hour window to work. We're in, in good clams like you see here. We can dig sometimes around seven to 10,000 pounds of clams on a tide with just a few people. So it's a really efficient way to harvest them. And then we unitize those baskets onto pallets so they just get picked up by the oyster boat when they're out there picking up the oyster tubs. Taylors and others have adopted this method. This is a machine that Taylors built using that same tulip bulb technology, but doing it with tracks and on a machine that's all galvanized and designed to hold up out in that salt water environment. This is them picking up some of the clams. So we put those nets down in that sandy substrate. They're down for three years to exclude predators from eating the clams, but there's lots of other things that grow underneath those nets protected from predation. So we pull those nets off and harvest the clams. All of that food that's been growing under there is now available for a lot of other critters to eat. So this is just time-lapse video a couple hours after we finished harvesting and the tides come back to show you the feeding frenzy that occurs there. Have a lot of water quality challenges. 
as an industry, this is a lot of the work I do for tailors in the broader industry is working on to try to address different sources of non-point pollution, whether it be septic systems or pet waste or agricultural runoff and so on. Different classifications under our National Shellfish Sanitation Program for growing areas. So approved is just that. There's no, no pollution, no harvest restrictions, conditionally approved. There's a number of areas in Puget Sound that are conditionally approved. So when it rains here, you have temporary closures to let the area clean up before there's harvesting allowed. Restricted is more polluted. You have to relay shellfish from those areas for long periods of time to clean areas prior to harvest. And then prohibited is just that. It's too polluted to do direct harvest. The Growers Association has an environmental code of practice. They've had this in place for over 20 years now, and we encourage our growers, we keep it updated and encourage our growers to follow the practices here to minimize any impact they might have on the environment when they're farming. This is a chart that just shows all of the regulations that are required to get a shellfish farm permitted in Washington state. There's multiple layers here that you have to go through. It's pretty intimidating to start a new farm. It takes quite a while to work your way through the local permitting process. If you've got a lease with the Department of Natural Resources, there's tribal approvals, there's public health regulations with the Department of Health. And then of course, the whole bottom third there is Army Corps of Engineer permitting and ESA consultation and, and so on there to make sure you're not having any kind of an impact on threatened and endangered species. Ecosystem services wise, um, Shellfish provide all, uh, some valuable services in the in the environment. So this is a system that doesn't have shellfish. It's got too many nutrients being added to it. So those nutrients come in and bloom that phytoplankton. Your zooplankton blooms. I don't know if you can see a mouse or not, but your zooplankton blooms to start consuming that phytoplankton, but it can't keep up with the blooms. They get out of control. They die. They decompose, and as they decompose, they create anoxic conditions and can potentially get cause fish kills. The, this plankton shades out the sunlight, so your submerged aquatic vegetation, your eelgrass and so on can disappear. And that's habit, valuable habitat for a lot of different species. When you add shellfish into the system, they create habitat structure, which is important, but also they're ready filters. So as soon as that phytoplankton starts to bloom, they kick in and start grazing on that phytoplankton and that allows the zooplankton to keep up with those phytoplankton blooms so you don't get that boom bust cycle you just get this moderate cycling of phytoplankton and zooplankton the sunlight can penetrate because the water is clearer so your eelgrass thrives and your nursery habitat thrives so it's a it's an ecosystem engineer shellfish or ecosystem engineers and it can be a really important part of uh, that ecosystem through the services they provide. This is just a, this is a 28 minute video captured in a 15 second time lapse. So it's a gallon of water in each of those tanks with the same amount of algae put in them, 60 clams in one, none in the other, just to demonstrate how effective they can be at cleaning up the water. Long time industry advocates for water quality. We did this with the pulp and paper industry. My predecessors did years ago, challenging those mills and from the pollution. And, and today our focus is more on the different non-point pollution sources. This is one of the tools we use to try to encourage people to grow shellfish. Uh, people that own the tidelands in front of their house to garden shellfish, have a shellfish garden. And then as they're buying the seed, we try to educate them about the importance of maintaining clean water and you know, maybe checking their septic system before they harvest that shellfish. And think about picking up after the dog and so on. It's a good water quality education tool. Hundreds of people buy seed from us every year to do this. It's become really popular. I'm running out of time. I think I better stop so we have time for questions. Just looking at my watch here. I was going to touch on ocean acidification, but maybe we can do that in questions if they come up. And I was just going to put a plug in if people are interested in learning more about the industry. This is a, a new edition of Heaven on the Half Shell. Uh, 
it was first done 20 years ago and they just updated it. It's just out recently, but it's got a lot of fun history on the shellfish industry here in, in Washington State. So we can shift to questions now if you want, Clarissa. I think we're doing about right on time, aren't we? Yeah. Nice job keeping yourself on track there. <laughs> um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A. Um, to start off, I do have a question. Um, the floating oyster racks, um, they're not really like just floating on the surface because then at high and low tide, you wouldn't have them submerged. So how does that work? So they are, they are, they're floating on the surface all the time, but a portion of them is underwater. And so the oysters that are in there are sitting underwater just at oh. the surface. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, innovative system. It's one that as the, you get barnacles or muscle set or algae starting to grow on the bottom of the bag and foul it, we have a device that goes on the side of a skiff where you can just drive down that line and flip the whole system over. So that fouling is sitting up in the air and starting to burn off while the oysters to continue to grow inside the bag, but the other side is now underwater. Mm -hmm. So it's, and then it's, it, it allows us to mechanize oyster farming as well. So we can come up with systems on our boat to bring those bags out, empty the oysters out, put seed back in them and redeploy them. So you're not bringing the bags in and out off the farm. So like our flip farm with the bags that flip up and down. When we harvest those, we disconnect the bags, bring them into the processing plant, empty the oysters out. We have to clean the barnacles off the bags and so on. It's a lot of labor. With these floating systems, the bag just stays deployed. We deal with the, the fouling naturally just by flipping that bag and not letting it get fouled. And it allows you to mechanize the handling of the oysters. So gets away from the night tides. There's just a lot of advantages to it. We're kind of excited about the direction it may take oyster farming. Nice. Um, we've got some questions rolling in. Um, we've got two pretty similar ones, so I'll kind of summarize. Um, is there any movement or investigation to return to using more natural materials for oyster farming, such as like wood or metal rather than plastic? No, well, there's been some efforts uh, by some companies to use biodegradable materials and, and, you know, trying to see ways we can reduce plastics and the biodegradable doesn't work because uh, it doesn't degrade underwater the same as it would as it's typically been developed for on land. So it's created more headaches than benefits. Um, and then you know the wood materials just don't last uh, unless they're treated and a lot of the treatments are not good for the shellfish or the environment and, and so the plastics that we use we try to be conscious about the materials they have uv inhibitors in them they're designed for this use so they don't break up and cause microplastics and so on and then we also try to be diligent about monitoring the age and condition of that equipment and retire it before it becomes an issue. But I know there's you know definitely concerns about the industry's use of plastics. We recognize that and we just try to be as responsible as possible with those uses. And then would there be concern about animals getting stuck in the nets rather than the plastic PVC pipes or are they mostly buried in the ground? So they're the I'm assuming that question is related to the gooey duck mesh tubes and they they don't trap animals that we've got a couple different styles of those um, but they're they're open enough that critters are coming and going in and out of them but not the big predators the first year they're typically closed so no, nothing is getting in you just pinch the top closed and then the second year you open them up, the gooey duck are down a little bit big, bigger and down deeper. So we'll open them up and clean any, sometimes you get cockle sets and things in there that will uh, restrict the gooey duck. So we clean stuff out, leave the tubes on another year and then pull them off. But yeah, we don't see any entrapment in those tubes. And then the, we're using a softer mesh tube as well <clears throat> that works well, particularly in areas where the tribes are gill netting. 
because that the rigid mesh tube will catch the bottom of the gill nets and the tribes are concerned about that. These flexible mesh tubes, the gill nets just slide right over them, so it's not a problem. Um, another question here, um, speaking of harvesting, when you harvest at one time, how much is it? Do you do like the whole farm or do you do sections or parts? Yeah, so again, it depends on the crop and how long it might take. Um, and you're doing sections and parts all the time. Like, you know, my personal farm, because it's a three year crop cycle and manila clams, roughly a third, third, third. So every year I've got something to harvest and replant. So I've got a constant stream of revenue off the farm. And that's pretty typical, you know, where people are, are harvesting sections because all of these things that we grow are usually multiple year crops. You've got different sections at different stages. Uh, some of the smaller farms, you know, you may harvest all at once and, and be done with it and not back. So. And then, yeah, and it varies how long it takes to harvest a crop, varies with the type of crop. So. Yeah. How does floating aquaculture compare to underwater aquaculture in terms of the ecosystem services? Is there a difference? I'll for the be, ecosystem services? I suppose there's probably some differences. You know, on bottom, you've got you've got structure on bottom. So your uh, benthic critters your, uh, that live in that benthic habitat would use that structured habitat versus something floating on the surface. You know, we still see fish and things interacting with that gear. It also creates structure for birds. Uh, a lot of birds will sit on them, which actually causes a us a public health concern, so so we're having to uh, purge those animals before we sell them. If there's been birds perching on the gear and so on, but it, it creates a roosting habitat for birds. Um, the, the shellfish are still providing the same ecosystem services, and that they're filtering the water, of course, whether they're on the bottom or floating. So. Still taking in that plankton but i guess yeah it depends on where they are in the water column they provide that habitat that difference right um another question um how are you dealing with ocean acidification and increasing temperatures are they posing big dangers to your farming yeah so that's a, a challenge that i didn't jump into there but we Oh, back around 2007, 2008, our oyster seed production collapsed. And at the same time, good friends of ours on the Oregon coast, another major hatchery, their production was collapsing. At the same time, areas where there was natural recruitment of oysters, that was failing. So we had a real seed crisis. And it was with the help of different university scientists and NOAA scientists that we came to understand that it was ocean acidification. And as carbon pollution is absorbed by the ocean, roughly a third of our uh, carbon emissions are absorbed by the ocean, and it changes the chemistry of the ocean. It, it produces carbonic acid, but more significantly for the shellfish, that chemical reaction that occurs reduces the amount of carbonate ions in the water, and those are what our shellfish build their shells with. And our baby oysters couldn't build their shells. They were The shells were dissolving faster than they were able to form them. And so they were dying and it took a while for that picture to come into focus for us with the help of all these scientists. But now we've got sophisticated in the hatcheries, we've got sophisticated water chemistry monitoring equipment and water treatment systems that boost up the carbonate ions in the water in response to that water monitoring equipment so that the animals are able to build their shells again. So that's we've got a workaround in the hatcheries and we've recovered our seed production. We are concerned as conditions get worse that it's going to be impacting animals in our nurseries and on our farms. And so from that standpoint, you know, advocating for uh, reducing our dependency on fossil fuels and addressing the source of the problem is a big part of what we do, but also trying to find refuges. Uh, you know, there may be natural refuges such as Samish Bay or Willapa Bay, where we've got big eelgrass meadows that are sucking up that carbon dioxide and naturally improving the water chemistry for the shellfish. 
or maybe co-culturing seaweed. There's been a project on the Hood Canal looking at co-culturing sugar kelp next to the shellfish farm to see if you could improve the water chemistry by doing that. So there's different different things that we're doing. Also breeding, we've got breeding programs looking at whether we can produce an oyster or shellfish that's more tolerant of the changing chemistry conditions and temperatures. Um, and then ultimately we may have to look at different species because not all of them are affected the same by the changing conditions. So. Um, is there any research to control the Japanese oyster drill um, that comes in with some oysters? So there has been some research done on it there. Nobody has come up with any effective controls. For the growers, it's largely just trying to keep them off their beds, clean them. You know, there's regulations to make sure we're not moving them around. Uh, the Department of Fisheries maintains, uh, we get transfer permits that dictate how we can move shellfish so we don't move drills. And then people just clean them off their beds and clean the egg cases off their beds when they see them. And that's the most effective way to control them. I was going to show that on the ocean acidification piece, this slide here, uh, to show what happens when there aren't enough carbonate ions in the water. So these are day-old oyster larvae. About This is a scanning electron microscope image. So these are about the diameter of a strand of hair. On the left is what they're supposed to look like. And on the right is what happens uh, if there's not enough carbonate ions in the water. So first 24 hours of life, they've got to do two things. They've got to build a shell and then this feeding organ that they swim and feed with, the vellum. And they do that with energy that's stored within the egg. And if there's not enough carbonate ions, they struggle to build that shell. And then they run out of energy before they build that feeding organ. And then they die because they can't get any more energy. So, you know. so by adding the carbonate ions back into the water, they're able to build their shell and look like the one on the left and complete that building of the vellum and able to feed and continue to grow. Uh, we have a question. Do oysters make pearls? They do. We get them in our Pacific oysters. Usually the shuckers find them uh, in the shucking room and they're shucking the oysters or occasionally a diner will get them and break a tooth and we'll have an insurance claim every now and then from that. <laughs> but these are not the high quality jewelry pearls, but you know they all do it. Plants will do it too. They'll get a, a sand grain in there and it irritates them and they can't spit it out. So they wall it off with shell and that's how it creates a pearl. But the jewelry pearls that you, you buy in the jewelry stores, those are typically cultured. And they do that with a different warm water species of oyster where they, they actually use fossilized mussel shells from the Mississippi River that they grind into perfectly round beads. And then they surgically implant those into the mantle of the oyster and it will start walling it off and create the pearl, create the cultured pearl. Uh, we'll do one more question. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone. Um, great question so far. Uh, last one. Um, just if you could further explain what oysters are filtering out of the water. Are they selective at what they take out of the water? And then what do they release back in? That's a great question. So they are selective. I, I have a video I use in my PowerPoint sometimes. It's pretty cool, actually. Uh, there's a guy at University of Connecticut that's specialized in shellfish feeding, researching it. And he actually uses an endoscope and cuts a notch in the shell and goes in and then feeds particles into it to watch how the gills collect those particles out of the water. But they are selective. They'll they'll capture algae, of course, microscopic algae that's in the water. That's what they're selecting for. But they'll get uh, silt particles and any kind of particulates that come in. The gills, the cilia, aren't selective. They catch it all, pass it to the ventral groove on the gills, gets entrained in mucus, and goes down to what's called the labial palps, which are kind of like lips. And the palps will sort that all that material that's coming in, decide food, not food, food, not food. And the not food gets entrained in mucus and expelled as what they call pseudo feces. And then the food gets digested and excreted as feces. Pretty weird. <laughs> For shellfish geeks, those videos are really cool. 
Well, thank you so much, Bill, for sharing all about uh, shellfish farming with us. And thank you, everyone else, for joining and asking such great questions. Um, again, this will be posted on our YouTube and Facebook channel, so you can share it with people or watch it if you missed um, the beginning of it. And then I hope you all have fun with your coloring pages. Thank you. Um... <laughs> Feel free to share those with us if you did, or make sure to print out the one for next talk. Um, our next Discovery Speaker Series will be on November 2nd. It will be 6.30 to 7.30 again, um, and you'll get to ask questions at the end. 